It is a huge honor for me to be sitting in Sydney, Arizona with an unbelievable man, Dr. Safa Dr. Suzani. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Howard. Pleasure, pleasure, um, pleasure being here. I've been told by several people that are extremely successful that this is the smartest businessman dentist in all of Australia. Um, so basically, um, his bio, you, uh, you started Dental Members Australia in 2011 by local Brisbane dentist, Dr. Safa Suzani. He was frustrated that his patients who needed the most dental work couldn't actually start treatment because of the upfront costs. So Dental Members Australia created a cloud platform to enable patients to pay for treatment in weekly or fortnightly payments. What does fortnightly mean? Fortnightly is every two weeks. Okay, so right. weekly or fortnightly. Okay. Right. DMA, which is Dental Members Australia Dental Vouchers, from $1,000 to $5,000. This voucher system combined with capped fee pricing is the first of its kind in Australia. Dental Members partnered with 1300 Smiles, which is one of the two publicly traded chains on the Australian stock exchange, ASX. It's 1300 Smiles. And what was the Pacific other one? Smalls Group. Pacific Dr. Smalls Alex Group. Alex Abrahams. And Alex Abrahams, which we podcasted over. You've already seen him. And who's the CEO of One Three Hundred Smiles, Do Daryl? Doctor Daryl Holmes. Yeah, and um, so we're gonna do we're gonna podcast. Is he a friend of yours? Absolutely, he's my mentor and a, and well, a very good friend. Well, what we'll do is we'll um, do his podcast over Skype. We love it, and we'll publish him the day after yours. Perfect. So we'll do Perfect. yours and his. Thank you. And um, and also, um, you own dental clinics. Like you own what five dental offices? Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. So so basically, here here's why I was so excited to get soft on the show. So. I've been a dentist for 30 years. When you tell someone they need dentistry, they only have two reactions. Half goes into fear, and they're like, oh my God, I need a crown. Are you gonna give me a shot? Is it gonna hurt? Um, can you put me out? Can you give me nitrous, whatever? The other half go into fear of cost. Oh my God, how much does that cost? I don't have insurance. I don't get paid till Friday. So it's just fear of pain and fear of cost is the two huge markets. And you're focused on, oh, well, what they want is same day dentistry, so I need to buy chair side milling. Do, do, what, what percent of, when you tell someone they need a crown, what percent are mostly concerned that they get it the same day with chair side milling? They're not concerned at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What percent are afraid of the, the shot and the dentist? And what percent are afraid of fear? Fear is high. Yeah, I, I, I'd say it's half and half. Half, half, half exactly. So when we always talk, one of my reoccurring themes are, that 10 people have to land on your website before your horrible website converts one to call the office. Three people have to call your office before your untrained receptionist can convert one to come in. Three people have to come in with a cavity before you convert one to drill, fill, and bill and do the dentistry. So for the average American doing 750000 in collection and taking home uh, 180, you literally, to, get, to do one filling, three have to come in. For three to come in, nine have to call. For nine to call, 90 have to land on your website. So what if your website addressed the two major concerns? And not with a still picture, not a bunch of text, but like a YouTube video where the first one says, hey, afraid of the dentist? If you're afraid of the dentist, you need to come in and talk to me. We're gentle, we have laughing nitros. You know, we, we pride ourselves in treating fear. Seriously, if you're afraid of the dentist, you need to come in and call me. In fact, call me right now, call to action, call my number. And then the other one is, hey, are you afraid of the, the cost of dentistry? Are you afraid this isn't be affordable? And if you don't talk money and your treatment coordinator talks money, your office manager talks money, whoever talks money in your office, she needs to do that video. Hey, I'm Veronica from Dr. Good's office. And if you have a problem um, or if you're worried about the cost of dentistry, give me a call. Let me talk to you. We have several things we can work out. And what I liked about you is um, you have innovated something new in the fear of cost, affordability. Uh, so tell my homies what you've done as far as on the cost side of this. Well, doc, Dr. Fran, the, um, as, as a practice owner, and the result of this was because I was seeing patients that couldn't actually afford the treatment that I was providing them. And, and, were, and you were working in Brisbane? I was working in Brisbane as a dentist. I had my own clinic at the time, and that was a complete frustration. Uh, I knew that it was uh, uh, because of the cost that they couldn't because I would spend the time, I'd be polite to them, I'd be nice to them. Yes, I'll think about it. So I started going to lots of seminars, treatment conversions, looking after patients, you know, all, all that sort of thing. But there is one fundamental thing I started looking at and that was the 
uh, average Australian household income and how much I was actually asking them to pay. And I would end up in seminars and the seminars would go, look, look after the top 20%. If they can't afford you, move them on. And slowly, slowly, I realized that dentistry is really a small cottage industry. It is we are focused on our own patients and we are in our own little bubble. People come to us, we do the work and people pay us. To actually think a little bit outside of that, to actually look after a larger portion of people, we have to think a little bit differently. Financing companies at the time weren't really an option because it was expensive. Interest rates were high. And at the time, 2009, I knew with new technologies coming like the cloud technology, software was becoming more, more prevalent. And with software, you could actually start doing direct debits very quickly. Uh, and so I actually stopped doing dentistry. At the time, I had two practices. And uh, I went and sold my apartment that I was living in and I stopped doing dentistry. I had associates working and I went and lived with my parents because the banks wouldn't lend me any money to do a software um, for direct debit. And I actually found a software company in Melbourne, came and lived here for a while and created a platform which is able to do direct debits in-house um, at a click of a button without needing staff. So it's a platform that can go into people's accounts, take direct debits in small amounts and do everything automatically. Send texts automatically, send emails automatically, take money for thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So as that finished, I thought, great, my problems are over. I'm going to now introduce this to the four or five dentists that work between these practices. Little I knew the problem was just beginning because dealing with the dentist and the frame of receiving money slowly is, is a problem of its own. So hence, that, that's how Dental Members Australia was born. That's it, that's it, and it began from there. So you're, you're advertising straight to the consumer? That's correct. For the first three or four years, we actually went out looking for dental practices and introduced membership programs to them. We called it the care plan and payment plan platforms. But we realized that to actually survive, you need high volume, and dental practices are not equipped they're not in sales. They, they can't get the treatment converted. They, can't, they don't discuss payment plans. Dentists don't want to discuss money or payment plans. So uh, we realize that we have to go externally. Luckily, in, in my travels, I met uh, now my mentor, Dr. Daryl Holmes, which is a... Who, uh, who's the founding dentist director, father absolutely. of 1-300 Smiles. Absolutely. One of only two publicly traded chains on the ASX, Absolute. the Australian Stock Exchange, it's um, 1300 Smiles with Daryl. And Pacific Smiles Group with Pacific Alex. Pacific Smiles Group with Alex. Alex, correct. So um, Alex Abrams. Alex Abrams. I was in my mid-30s and I flew up to Townsville where Daryl is based and um, introduced this membership program and the membership program was you pay $30 a month, the software does it all and the patients can come in and get all their exam clean and fluoride done. Uh, twice a year. Luckily, at that uh, meeting, there were executives there that were involved in membership programs with other industries that were doing consulting for Daryl, uh, mainly the gym industry. This is five, six years ago. So I met with some of them. Uh, we rolled the ideas and we rolled the membership program in all of 1300 Smiles practices. And how many practices do they have? They have 25 large practices. 25 very prominent practices, mainly in and Queensland. What, and Queensland is Brisbane. Exactly. Brisbane, Gold Rockhampton, Coast. Gold Coast. It's that region there. And when you say 25 large offices, like how many operatories and dentists and average practice? Are? Some of some of Daryl's practices could be 10, 11 chairs, 12 chairs. Daryl, uh, 1300 Smiles, is the most profitable dental uh, corporate here in Australia. Uh, and I learned a lot from them. Do they have hygienists? Hygienists that don't have, and generally I believe it's because probably the rooms are pretty full with dentists doing the work. So um, I noticed I noticed the um, one three hundred smiles and Pacific Dental Group. Neither of them use hygienists. Yes, it, hygienists haven't really taken off as much as the, I believe as as, uh, as the United States. Uh, our own practices, the practices that we have, smaller practices, they do have. We do have hygienists. In year five. Correct. So you have hygienists in all five years. Uh, we have hygienists in three of them. Um, well, I think in the United States, a lot of people, you know, they 
their their thinking is, well, I want to have the hygienist because I could be doing profitable dentist. Correct. But the problem in the hygiene department is when they're paying their hygienist forty dollars an hour. Correct. And the PPO is only giving them forty five or fifty for a cleaning. They're they're losing their butt. Absolutely. And then with the increase in glut of um, um, young dentists out of school, um, whenever you um, put an ad out for a hygienist, you'll have dental students call up and say, I'll take that job. Yes. So then all the really cost-focused corporate dental chains will say, well, I'd rather have the dentist do the cleaning because then they can bond and meet with the patient and then later on do fillings and crowns and other dentistry. And that's exactly the situation here. Oh. That's exactly the situation here. So, yes, and um, uh, we, we eventually stopped actually looking for dental practices, uh, wanting to convince dentists about membership programs and payment plans. We found that it wasn't working, the staff turnover of dental practices, the whole way the dentistry is done. So we, only about two years ago, we changed our focus into the actual patients, telling patients what we have. And with social media, Facebook uh, especially, we were able to reach a large portion of people. And there we realized, wow, people actually want this because we put a post up about, you know, affordable dentistry and wham, there is a hundred comments. How can I get access to it? So in lieu of that, we started focusing on our own practices, my own practices and Daryl's. We actually at the moment don't accept any more dental practices coming on board because it's too difficult and too costly. And we just focus on building our own practices via various payment plan solution. And Dr. Fran, most of these payment plan solutions are sold before the patient goes to the dental practice in a voucher system. This is where we're finding the best results. Not that the patient goes to the dentist, meets the dentist, and the dentist recommends a treatment plan and then goes on a payment plan. We're not doing that. Because we then again are reliant on the dentist and the dentist has their own set mind on various things depending on what I've done on the past. So we have a professional help desk. Patients call up, I need dentistry, I know I haven't been, what do you recommend to help this? Is look, we've got a $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, $5,000 package. Why don't you start with a $3,000 payment plan? It's $99 a week. After your second or third payment, go to this particular dentist, Dr. Safa Suzani, who does this particular procedure really well, he is about 15 kilometers away from you, and he will start your work. So we have taken away the whole price of what happens inside the dental practice externally, and we send the patients externally into the practices. So you, they have to make a couple, two or three payments before? Correct, two or three payments. To make sure everything's good? Everything's good, everything's so, okay. So before you're extending credit to them, is software better these days in determining who's a credit risk? Absolutely. There's various, various things we can do. Uh, we don't have a, uh, we have various statistics that we know out of every bank account, we have an 8% failure rate uh, of direct debit. But of those 8%, we know bad debt is only 1, 2 or 3%. Noting that we don't go and finish the work immediately either. So we start with the emergency work. So we first get the patient and do a treatment plan, start with the emergency work, and then every four to six weeks, depending on the payment plan. So you say 8% is bad debt. Oh, no, 8% is default. Default. A bad debt is 1, 2, 3%. But what was the difference between bad debt, 1, 2, 3% versus an 8% default? So foul payment is if they failed the payment, but they will come to the practice and actually pay that, pay that off. Uh, bad debt is, look, we've finished the work, and they've... That, that we're not going to see them again. And again, that's why we're actually dealing with our own practices because dentists, we find, will focus on that 1% or 2%. And suddenly say, look, I've done a procedure. I did a crown for $1,000. I only received 750 for it. The patient closed their bank account. It's one out of 20 patients, and they, they, they don't want to do the voucher system anymore. So we find that the focus becomes that. And once the focus becomes that, it becomes it becomes difficult. So we have our own dentists. Most of them are employment model, so they don't have to worry about that. And that's how we're starting to. What do you mean they grow. don't have to worry about it because they're not getting paid on collections or getting paid on production? Uh, no, we they do actually get paid on collection, but most of the new generation coming through are actually on a salary, Doctor Ferrand. So they're on a salary package. Is it a salary versus percentage? 
Correct. I think once it hits a particular level, then it goes into. So commission. what? What is the? How does the? What is the entry? What is the salary? And what is the percent collection? Generally, at the moment, uh, for our clinics, the uh, commission base goes from thirty-five to forty percent, depending on the level of experience. And salary packages start at eighty, ninety thousand dollars Australian. So they start with an eighty to ninety thousand dollars salary. Correct. And then um, thirty-five to forty percent of collection, but that's after lab bill, right? Correct. Uh, the lab bill's taken out of that. So, so uh, it's the collected revenue minus the lab bill times forty percent. 35 to 40 percent. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And that's becoming more easier because the number of dentists in Australia is very high at the moment. The number of dental schools that have opened up over the last few years has increased dramatically. The government 457 visas has had a mig huge migration of dentists that have come to Australia. And that was the government what visa? And they refer to it as the 457 skilled visa. Four, five, seven. Correct. Skill visa. Skill visa. And um, and I I think um, you know, this is like I think the sixth time I've been uh, down under, and um, I you know, starting in the nineties, I would come down and do five cities in ten days. I'd do um, Auckland, New Zealand, Melbourne, Sydney, Gold Coast, Perth, and I did that five city tour like three times, and been down here other times. And when I was coming down here in the nineties, and I'd ask the dentist, so what is your main problem? And the main problem is if someone called with a toothache, I couldn't get him in for six weeks. And I told them, I told them, you know, your government is not going to like that. No. <laughs> and um, the government is going to go uh, crazy. And the dentist didn't solve that problem. So the government got in, gave these visas. How many foreign trained dentists did they let in in the last five thousands, years? Thousands. I'm thousands. not sure of a number, but the thousands. Yeah. And, and, and then how many, what did they do to the number of dental schools? At least new five or six new dental schools. They doubled the number of dental schools. Absolutely. And so, and then corporate dentistry came. Absolutely. And then you had the global financial crisis of 2008. So the, the economy got rocked. While they doubled the supply of dental schools, they let in thousands of foreign trained dentists, mostly from Asia. Absolutely. And now it's a very competitive environment. Yes. The, the dentists are upset, but the patients aren't upset. No. no. The government's not upset. Yes. And um, and you still have that problem in the United States where these dentists don't realize that the reason they're building so many dental schools is because people call up and say, yeah, I, I broke my tooth. Is there any way you can see me today? And they're like, well, no, I can't see you for five days. They go, well, it's an emergency. My tooth broke. And they go, well, are you in, in pain? Did it wake you up at night? No. Are you taking aspirin and Tylenol? Well, you're not it. That's not an emergency. You just sure. broke your tooth. Wait five days. And um, Americans can get a pizza delivered in 30 minutes. Absolutely. But I have to wait five days to see a dentist. To see a dentist. And then to get your teeth cleaned with a hygienist, several weeks. Absolutely. And then in Phoenix, um, on Sunday, um, you'd be better off breaking your leg <laughs> than your tooth. Because if you broke your leg on a Sunday, you could call an ambulance. They'd pick you up. Yes. They'd take you to the hospital. It'd be fully staffed on Christmas, Easter, Hanukkah. Seven days a week, they'd fix it. Um, you know what the chances you get your teeth clean in Phoenix on a Sunday? Zero. Zero. Absolutely. And then the dentist is saying, "Well, why are why are they why do they keep building dental schools? Uh, because you all work Monday through Thursday, eight to five. Yes. And so they're going to keep doing things. Absolutely. Until people can get dentistry seven days a week, like they can get bypasses done seven days a week." Broken legs fixed seven days a week. You can get a bypass in the middle of the night on Christmas if you drop if you drop, you drop of a heart attack. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. So we have a whole lot of dentists here that complain a lot about the number of dentists and the, the number of competition. But uh, perhaps we forget that we are in in the health industry, which is primary primary health. We're here to look after people, uh, to actually care, and teeth are very important. Um, yet, you know, uh, a lot of things come into it that um, the dentist would only see their own point of view. Right. You well, know? that's what all humans do. Absolutely. Yeah, hum Absolutely. Humans only see their own point of view. Absolutely. And the best businessmen are the ones that um, meet someone else. They say, this is what I need and I can see what you need and we can find common ground. Absolutely. And a poor businessman is trying to shove down your throat what I need Absolutely. without any ground for you need. And when you look at when you look at financing, if it costs over a thousand dollars, ninety percent of the time it's going to be finance. Absolutely. So then that says, "Well, I don't want to do financing." Yeah. 
Yeah. Abs absolutely. And it reminds me, I'm a, I'm Irish um, descendant. I'm, I'm yes. 100% Irish. And if I asked you, what's the greatest sewing machine in the world, what would you say? Name a brand of sewing machine that you think. Sting, is it sting, 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 Singer. Singer, that's right. Singer. You know why? Why is that? Because the Irish diaspora was uh, 1850. It was 40 years before the Statue of Liberty when a million Irish starved to death and a million left and landed on America. And there was like 85 different sewing machine Jeez. manufacturers. All the jobs were in textiles. And it was only Singer who realized that none of these Irishmen can get a job because they don't have $50 for a sewing, sewing machine. machine. So he was the only one. Everyone else needed 50 bucks for a sewing machine. It was only Singer who said, hey, come here, Irish guy. I'll give you a $50 sewing machine. You can get a textile job. Every Friday, they're going to pay you 3 bucks. But you got to come back and give me one of those bucks smart. for smart. 50 weeks, and then you own your sewing machine. So where do the all Irish go? To Singer. They all got jobs. Who bankrupted all the other sewing machine factors? Because they have installment credit. Another story was um, everybody knows that Henry Ford Absolutely. started the, the assembly line. Absolutely. And he and halved the price of his cars and made it only black. They they started at six hundred and sixty eight, and ten million units later it was two twenty eight. So he's doing very good at making everything faster, easier, higher quality, lower costs. He kept tinkering his assembly line, driving down costs and efficiencies. But no one talks about well, what was the end? Why did they stop at ten million? And they stopped at ten million because of GM, GM, absolutely. And GM secret was GMAC financing. Yes. And GM said, well, Henry. He needs all of his money up front. But you buy a car from GM, GMAC Financing will give you installment credit and you can make payments for 36 months. Absolutely. And that's what shut down Ford's Model T assembly line. Absolutely. And, 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 and GM, I believe, Dr. Frank, couldn't compete with the low price. So GM was one of the first companies that said, look, I will put in these cars absolutely everything. So I won't play in the middle. I will go and produce the Cadillac, the electric window, and I will go and uh, market to the, to the Beverly Hills actors and actresses and have the price way up here. Uh, because I can't be as low as Henry, Henry Ford's card. I can be either top or really bottom. I can't compete in the bottom. I'll go right to the top. So, uh, you know, again, they, they pick their mark and they stick to it and they persist and eventually they win. Um, whereas I think we discussed in the, uh, uh, before, uh, once you play in the middle and, uh, and you don't have a focus of where you want to be, you're either the high-end dentist charging thousands of dollars or you've got to have affordability, uh, access seven days a week, uh, long hours, so on and so forth. Playing in the middle uh, in an environment, in a competitive environment, uh, will no longer uh, uh, get you growing. Well, you know, I think that, you know, if I had to give a dental student a, a magical, if I could wave a wand and give it to you, um, I'd want you to be able to walk in that operatory and have instant likability and trust, an amazing chair side manner that shows empathy, compassion, connecting, and you can really communicate um, that you actually have, you know, these cavities and you can show them on the digital x-rays, intro cameras, you know, um, no one cares about all the alphabet soup degrees behind your name. They don't even know what any of that stuff means. They don't care. They never even ask you what dental school you go to. Absolutely so not. So you can think, well, I went to the best dental school in Queensland. No one cares. No. Do they like you? Do they trust you? It's uh, here. Do that. Is, is there a connection from here? Is there care? It's that human connection at the end of the day that matters the most. And then after that, they're going to be afraid of the dentistry. So you've got to be able to say, you're going to be okay. You know, if you raise your hand, I'll stop. I'm not going to hurt you. I love being a gentle dentist. We're going to get through this. You're going to be okay. Fear fear of pain. pain. And the fear of pain is weird. I mean, I have men come in that could pick me up and throw me on a roof who have sleeve tattoos. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so your tattoo was 1,000 shots. Yes. And you're afraid of my one shot. So it's all, it's all just in their head. Yeah. And um, But you address the, the other completely major concern fear of cost and i want to talk about fixed uh, pricing because i hear you know anytime i get on an airplane sit so next to me i ask about their dental experience this and that and they always they always say things like well he told me i need a crown and he told me it was a thousand dollars but then when i got up front 
they added on another two hundred dollars for a buildup. Um, implants are the worst. Absolutely. Well, I called them up. They told me the implant was fifteen hundred dollars, but then when I got it, when I went to pay, it was fifteen hundred dollars for the implant. And it was a thousand dollars for the bone graft, and it was another five hundred for a surgical guide. and And I thought it was going to cost fifteen hundred. And by the time I got up front, it was almost four thousand dollars. Absolutely. So, what would you say about that? And that's exactly it. that. That is that is totally one of the things that exist in, in in our community as dentists. The patients not knowing what what prices are really are. And what total cost? What are. total cost are and, and the additions? But that psychology actually begins before them stepping into a dental practice, and that what stops patients coming in. And the story comes from the uh, Olympics in London, where they brought her actually a pricing specialist from the United States into London, and they said, "Look, uh, we're under trouble. We need to be selling. I'm not sure about the figures. You know, about six hundred million dollars in worth of ticket sales for this London Olympics, or else we're going to go broke." So the pricing specialist from the United States, I'm not sure if the gentleman's name, said, "Look, the only way I will commit to helping you guys is." that I do not have any interference about what I'm going to say. You sign this contract, there can't be any interference. So he came, I believe it was the 2000 and, Dr. Fran, 2011 was the London Olympics or 2001, one of those. But what he did was he said simplicity of pricing. London Olympics, all of the fees, if it was 2001, is going to be 20 pounds, between two to 20 pounds. Kids, Age, whatever your age is, if you have a 14-year-old child, the price will be £14. By making the price simplicity to the public and advertising it, the ticket sales for the London Olympics were the most successful ever. By simplicity of pricing. The price itself is not so much the issue, is the unknown. It's a bit like going to the restaurant and wanting to order and there is no price on the steak you want to order. I'm sure, you know, you could potentially afford 50, 60, 70 dollars for a steak, but not knowing makes it worse. And this is what the pricing specialist actually did from the United States. There's a story I read it potentially. I don't even like, I don't even like going to um, uh, uh, dinner, these fancy dinners with dentists. Yes. Because they expect that, you know, if it's uh, four people, we're just gonna split the bill. Yes. but. If you if you go to dinner with four dentists, one of them's going to order a five hundred dollar bottle of wine, <laughs> and I'm not going to drink any of your wine, and Absolutely. I really don't want to pay for half of your five hundred dollar bottle of wine. Absolutely. We were having dinner the other night, yes, and it was four guys, and they bring the bill, and it's a thousand dollars. I see. And the dumbass says, "Okay, so it's two fifty. He says, yeah. "Everybody give America's Express two fifty each." I'm like two fifty each. You ordered a six hundred dollar bottle of wine, and you and your asshole buddy drank the whole thing. Absolutely. I think that you guys should just split the bill between the two of you. Absolutely. Because my little fifty dollar dinner is Absolutely. not even a rounding error on yeah. your stupid bottle and, of wine. And it's not about it, it, it. It's the psychology of it all, isn't it, Doctor? Yeah. It's the psychology of that not knowing. So we, the moment we introduce the cat fees, we we cannot keep up with the demand. On our social media, uh, I'm constantly told, stop, stop the posts because the help desk of seven people can't keep up. We don't have the facilities. We don't have the chairs. So what, what, what are you advertising cat fees on for, like, capped total fee for a filling, a filling, crown? Fillings a cat fee, crowns a cat fee, root canals a cat fee. And what is, the, what is the fee? The fee for fillings is $149 Australian. Uh, now, that is not liked amongst our... Um, Queensland colleagues, um, they believe that you know it, it's too low, and we're doing this dentistry and that dentistry. But the the pure fact of it is, I I've, I've been a dentist for twenty years, Doctor Fran. I will do one hundred forty nine dollar quadrant filling dentistry all that long if I had to. And then what's the fee for a crown? Crowns or ceramic is nine hundred ninety nine dollars. That's a lot. In Thousand a, bucks. In in Queensland, a dentist most dentists are in the fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars a crown. Yeah. They still sit there, rather do two crowns a week, but at 15 to 18. What, what other cap fees do you have and what are they? So 999 is for crowns, 149 is for fillings. So, so why are you doing 999 instead of 1,000 and 149? 
It's an interesting question. I think this was partly again between the uh, colleague of mine, David Cook, who's 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 a membership guru from Fitness First, that is part of our team, and also Daryl. You know, uh, because I believe a lot of that's an error. I believe a lot of people think they believe it's urban legend that nine ninety nine sounds cheaper than a thousand. Yeah, potentially. But but, but the but the um, PhD economist yes, say that, that I follow say there's there's no evidence that where it actually started from yes was when they when they started with the cash registers they needed they for internal control over peculation embezzlement stealing um, and just general accounting they they needed to know how many transactions were done yep so uh, going back to 1850 in New York City. When they opened the cash register, they they bust open a roll of pennies and put in fifty pennies, and then instead of charging a dollar, they charge ninety nine cents. So at the end, so every time someone gave you a dollar, you had to give them a penny. So at the end of the day, I count the pennies, and there's only twenty pennies. We started with fifty, so now I know you did thirty transactions. Oh, I see. And that was a data point they needed. Oh, I see. But after they did that for a hundred years, urban legend was well, it just sounds better. Beta. If it's ninety nine cents, but you know, actually nine ninety nine, one forty nine, it's it, it's it, uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Exactly. But there's no evidence that people buy more at ninety nine than they'll do for one dollar. One forty. Well, I see. So it was an internal control over peculation. They wanted a, they wanted a transaction count. Oh, I understand, and, and hence it's continued a, on now through hundred years. And later. that's why, and that's also uh, that copper penny. That's also why cops are called cops. cops. You know why cops are called cops? Because of that. Because in the um, the original New York City police officers, you know, you know the Yankees emblem, the New York Yankees. Yes, that was the emblem for the New York cops, or uh, New York police officers, officers. The New York City police officers, and they were made of copper. Oh, I see. Like it's... the copper penny, so they wore that Yankee, that New York City emblem, oh. but it was made of copper, so they were called cops. Cops. Because a lot of people think that um, calling them a cops is is disrespectful. Or but it's not. No. It, it's it's urban slang. But but so so you're charging nine ninety nine or a thousand for a crown. Thousand, correct. A hundred and fifty for a filling. Correct. What about a root canal? Root canal caps at a thousand also. So, so a root canal is a thousand. Uh, uh, for a, a mole, for a molar. And a molar and a crown's a thousand. Correct. And a filling's one forty nine. That's nice money. In Australia, that's considered. We are. What what are these guys doing wrong, to be charging so little? Uh, amongst our community, amongst the dentists. Of course, we, we're not interested to see what Dr. You know, Joe Smith There is a lot of money in Australia. Like, like, we're in Sydney. What is the average price of the average home in Sydney, Australia? It, it's ridiculously high. But uh, do, you, do you know what it is? Because I saw a number the other day in the paper. Seven, eight hundred thousand? Yeah, seven hundred and fifty. The average home in Sydney Correct. costs seven fifty. And I thought, damn. Correct, correct. A lot of this was, of course, with the Chinese coming in. Uh, with money and sort of inflating the inflating the costs. Yeah. Here. You mean after the Hong Kong? Yes, chi even China mainland. Uh, a lot of the China mainland. Is, is is there still a lot of Chinese money coming here? Th there was up until recently. And then it's backed off. It, correct. And why? What do you think it's backed off? I think the government regulations. Uh, from been, Australia or fr from, from Australia, yeah. to, because of the price increases. So there's there will be a lot of Chinese that own apartments here, but the apartments will be sitting empty. Um, and that was happening here, but it is massively over, very very expensive here. Yeah. Housing is very expensive. Um, so so now now how does this work? So you have cap total fees. Correct. And then you you market mostly on Facebook and social media. But what what does social media mean? Facebook. Facebook mostly it's Facebook, and any others? A little bit on Google. Uh, Google Plus, or. Uh, Google AdWords. Google AdWords. Google AdWords. Okay, so Facebook, Google AdWords. Anything else? That's it, essentially. We've just recently. And your and your um advert and so what is what does your average ad look like? An average ad is um you know start your dental treatment with forty nine to ninety nine dollar per week dental payment plans. Vouchers available from one thousand to five thousand. So we then start communication via social media. Then we have a professional help desk where. They're dentally trained. They understand dentistry, so we're not reliant on the dentist or the practice reception. So they can call that number and talk. That's right. They call and that number. So you're controlling the inbound conversation. Absolutely. The inbound phone calls. Absolutely. So we have a whole dialogue of what goes on. We can't rely. We used to rely on the practice reception, but it's a difficult task. Practice reception gets busy. And you're busy. only doing this for one three hundred smiles, and they have. 
20, how many offices? 25. 25 and, and you're five. Correct. So you're only doing this for your for these 30 offices? Yes, and Dr. Fran, just the main practice that I'm at, and I'm practice two days a week, across the road, we are in the planning section to open a super clinic to cope with the demand, hopefully eight, nine, ten chairs. So we have an existing five chair facility and we're building a purpose built building called the Dental Member Super Clinic and we've asked the council now, we've got the land for at least eight, ten, twelve chairs as well as the five just in that one so region. For the 20, so 25 offices for one, three hundred miles, five years, that's 30. How much revenue are you selling per week, month, year? At the moment, the dental vouchers with the capacity that we have, we're selling about a million dollars a month. A million a month? A million a month. That's amazing. Through a help desk. So these patients are not, I want to see this Dr. John Smith or Dr. Safa Suzani. These patients are ringing, yes, I need to see a dentist, I'm interested, I will start paying. The problem is at the moment, some of the clinics are so full that the number amount of collection is higher than the production. So in the main practice that I'm at, the collection, the money we're receiving via direct debit is higher. Patients are getting annoyed because it's taking time to see them and then refunds start happening. So the problem we have is actually absolute opposite of what's happening out there with dental clinics. Um, so what's your plan? It's in 30 offices, it's not in Sydney, it's not in Melbourne. So in Australia, Half the population lives in Melbourne and Sydney. I mean, each town has about four and a half million. Correct. That's nine million total. There's only 20, how many in the total state, country? 20 million? 20, 23 million. 23 million. So nine million live in Melbourne and Sydney. So for all my homies listening in Melbourne and Sydney, when will this be available in Melbourne and Sydney? For them, never, Dr. Ferran. We've for them, never. For, ne for them, never. We, we cannot sit, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say to Dennis, we can't actually sit in front of a dentist and actually explain the process to them or actually train the whole system. The, we have decided that the, our website says registration to Dental Members Australia is closed. Our focus is only the patient because changing is a difficult task. But, but will you sell these vouchers to Australians in Melbourne and Sydney? Only if we have our own clinics there. Only if you have your own clinics? Correct. Only if we have our own clinics there. Uh, under our own system, the whole full circle, our dentists under employment, our own areas, our own centers, our own scanning centers, our own clinics, our own organization. So will you try to go and get the other Pacific Dental Smiles? Uh, look, Dr. Alex Abraham is an extremely, extremely astute and, uh, gentleman there. We are, uh, in the earlier days, we met with Alex, Dr. Alex uh, about our membership program, and we've always have been in talk, but no, again, we're, 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 we're only yeah. interested. A lot and, of the but, but the point I make is, is um, a lot of dentists are trying to wrestle with the decision they want to make in their office. Well, in an office, you can make a really bad decision and that bad decision might only be just like a little Doberman pincher in the corner snapping at you. But by the time you get to 50 locations, that little Doberman pincher could be a Tyrannosaurus Rex and take down the whole operation. So a lot of times you're wondering, well, should I get, should I do this or should I do that? You ought to have played out the infant and say, well, well, why don't you go see what Heartland Dental is doing? They got 500 locations. Pacific Dental has 350 locations. Comfort Dental has like 150 locations. You know, a lot of times it's really good to go see what the major players are doing. Because like I say, you can, you can make some grand mistakes, but still eat that mistake in a solo practice. In fact, you might eat a mistake and be losing money and not even know it. Like some of you guys are losing money in your hygiene department, but you make a decision, well, you know what? Maybe I should, I, I could keep a second hygienist busy. So now instead of losing, you know, $300 a day, you're losing $600 a day, but you don't even know it, and it all blends with the turbulence of the time. But by the time you have 500 offices, you, you can't do that. Correct. So um, there's a lot of, um, um, With so that's why I always tell people, if you have something and the solo practicing dentist doesn't get it because they're not businessmen, they have no training in business, I tell them, why don't you go first pitch this to Rick Workman of Heartland or Steve Thorne of Pacific Dental or pitch it to Aspen, pitch it to these major players because that's where you have a business team that will sit down and it doesn't surprise me that the only other dentist you let do this 
is a dentist that's publicly traded and has 25 locations. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. they're they they because in any um, industry, uh, I don't care if you're if you're selling cars or fixing teeth, it's 51% business Absolutely. and 49% cars. And once you think it's all about the car and it's all about the dentistry, then you're you're going to go bankrupt. I mean, Absolutely. it's 51% business. I don't care if you're selling iPhones, microphones, root canals, or cars. Absolutely. It's always more business than your art and craft. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of the corporates, of course, here also have dentists that are self-employed, Dr. Friend. So they're on a commercial basis and they're referred to as self-employed. So a self-employed dentist uses the facilities at Pacific Smiles Group, at 1300 Smile, but they run their own business within a business. And again, that can be limiting because essentially that dentist from Pacific Smiles could go, I'm not really interested in dental vouchers at $149 fillings because I'm a self-employed dentist at these facilities. So again, that has its own limit limiting factors. So what advice, um, how, long you, how, how long have you been a dentist? I mean, it's 20 years. 20 years. So what would you tell, um, so on Dental Town, um, there's um, 20,000 dentists in Australia. And before I left, I looked up how many um, Australian dentists are members of Dental Town. And it's, it's, it's north of 4,000. Yep. And over 400 um, next door in New Zealand. What would you, but they seem to be more millennials. Yep. What would you tell, what advice would you give? Uh, you've been doing this 20 years. What would you give, what advice would you tell her? She just graduated from dental school. And she's um, she's leaving dental kindergarten. Yep. And she's gonna go open up her own practice. What 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 advice would you give her to be a successful dentist? I say firstly, Doctor Doctor Lisa, that that twenty three twenty four year old, not to listen to people like me, um, and uh, and believe in yourself and what you're doing, and uh, what you believe is here, because. Things are changing so quickly that what I believed five years ago is absolutely irrelevant for today. Uh, so I wouldn't want to listen to me, Dr. Faram, because uh, I've gone through various things that have shaped my own uh, belief system. And that belief system no longer holds true in a world where information technology changes everything so quickly and you pick up your phone, you've been brought up with it with a phone in, in your hand for the last 10 years and you can get any information you want. Listening to me could potentially uh, hamper your growth. So um, I know that as long as you care, care from here, uh, you'll, you'll be okay. You don't need to actually listen to me. Uh, that's the advice I would give them. Nice, I always tell every dentist, my four boys, uh, the main thing is to be happy and healthy. Absolutely. And if you're not happy and you're doing things you don't like to do for money, you're going to quickly become unhealthy, you're going to become an alcoholic, you're going to be passive aggressive, you're going to be very upset. Um, in the end, we all die and we, in the end, we all live in the same size condo, Absolutely. a little casket. And um, just, you know, just be happy and healthy. And I think if you uh, maintain happy and healthy... And quit doing things you hate for money. And life is an attitude. Absolutely. And just uh, just be happy and get through it. Um, everything that you're stressing out at at 25, um, when you're 55, I look at the things you're stressing out at 25, and I'm just like, well, when you're 55, it, it's going to be a joke. I mean, so, <laughs> so everything that scares the shit out of you is just because you're only 25. And, um, you know, just like that, that molar root canal scares the shit out of you. Because it's your first one. It's your third one. When you've done a thousand molar root canals, they're not hard. No. Um, you, you won't pull a wisdom dude because you're afraid of it. Well, pull it anyway. And, and the first hundred are going to suck. But after you pull a hundred or a thousand, they're all fun and easy. Um, it's, it's like swimming. So I had four boys. Uh, the biggest nightmare I had. The, one of the biggest decisions I struggles I ever made was... Uh, putting a swimming pool in your backyard. Because the last thing you want is one of your kids to drown. So you put a fence over it, but you know, someone can leave the gate open and all that stuff. So my deal was, when I put a swimming pool, I didn't care what their age was, I made them all take swimming lessons. And it was so funny because they were all scared, they were all scared, they were all scared, and they cried and they hung on, you know, hanging on for dear life. And the bottom line is, he had to forcibly take the kid off, you hand it to the instructor, instructor. and leave, and the first thing she did is jumped in the pool with them, 
And in five minutes, they were all having fun, fun. and splashing and learning how to do it. Same thing with the... Why, why are you referring out all your wisdom teeth? Why are you referring out all your second molars? Because you're afraid. You know, every one you do that kicks your ass makes you better on the next one. Life's an attitude. Half, I mean, what's the worst case scenario when you're, when you're pulling a wisdom teeth you can't get it out? That you got to stop halfway through and send it to an oral surgeon to finish it? That you got to temporize this root canal and send it to an endodontist? Um, you know, just, just have fun, just relax. And, um, and I also don't think you went to school eight years, uh, to be an employee working for someone else. Uh, I never seen two dentists agree on anything. Absolutely. So, and, and another, uh, give, give, I want you to give this first, cause you moved back with your parents Correct. to save money to launch this program. Correct. Correct. I want to, I want to ask you one, one of the stressful things I say, and I don't really know how to answer this cause I'm a man. But a lot of girls, um, their dad's a dentist. Yes. And she was the, the pride of his life, his little princess. She could do no wrong. She comes out of dental school. He kind of guilt fathers her to come back and work with me. Wait. And then she's working with her dad and she's miserable. Because she's always going to be the little princess. Correct. He doesn't treat her like an equal. Cool. He's bossing her around, telling her what to do. What would you say to a 25-year-old girl who loves her dad more than anything, but really is having, is really frustrated working for her <laughs> old man? What would you say to her? Turn your back and move on. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Or go to your mom. Just go to your mom and say, Mom, what would you do? I mean, you married him. I'm not married to him. But I, I tell these girls, you know, and the other thing, I'd rather you move on. So you can keep a great relationship with your dad. Absolutely. Then working with him until you get to a point where you go separate ways and don't ever talk to each other again. Correct. And have you seen that case before? Absolutely. You know how many dentists I know that work for their dad for three or four or five years yes. and now they haven't talked one, one time, time in 10 or 20 yes. years. And we're talking about a lot of dentists and some very big name dentists. Yes. I mean, there's dentists out there that are very famous who haven't talked to their son for a long in time. 20 years. Yes. So don't do, don't do things you don't like to do for money, yes. including working for your dad, Absolutely. working for your mom. So be happy now. What other advice would you give her? What, what advice would you tell her if she says, you know, I got $200,000 of student loans. How would I, you know, should she, should that scare her? Should that, is that a big threat or concern? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, um, a, a number in, is a number, isn't it? On, on a bank statement and, and uh, you just start slowly and you have to be prepared to fail uh, and you keep failing and you, and you move on and you learn from each little failure and, and you get better and better and, and move on uh, and uh, you, become, uh, you become stronger. Uh, at each at, at each step of the way, so you have to see it as a as um, your you have to you have to go under pressure to 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 get better. If you don't want to go under pressure, you will never become a bigger person. So pressure is a is a great thing, um, and um, I've certainly had a quite a bit of pressure, Dr. Fram from from Dr. Daryl Holmes, who's a who's a very strong-minded, strong personality, in his fifties. Uh, uh, that um, you, you become you become better. So pressure is a good thing. And as Dr. Fran said, if something worries you and scares you, you have to actually embrace that. You have to go, yes, this is it. I will grow from this. My favorite rock and roll line growing up was Janis Joplin when uh, she sung, uh, freedom is when you got nothing left to lose. Absolutely. And you, that's the attitude. I mean, so you sit there and say, well, I'm afraid to open up my business because what if it went bankrupt? Well, what if it went bankrupt? Yes. Who cares? It went yeah. bankrupt. Go get a job with one 300 smiles. <laughs> Go get a job Pacific. Go get a job in an hour. <laughs> You'll sit there and say, well, what if I start pulling this wizard and I can't get out? Who cares? They're called oral surgeons. Some, someone's going to finish it. You know, you start a root canal and you, say, you can't find the canal. They're called endodontists. Freedom's when you got nothing left to lose, and you know what your you what your biggest fear is? Your big ego. Absolutely. Your huge ego. And when I talk to when I'm sitting next to an airplane, and I say, if you if I was talking, say like a politician, a dentist, a lawyer, a, a physician, let's just say a dentist. Would you say dentists by and large are humble? So I roll their eyes and laugh. I'll say describe three adjectives for a dentist. Arrogant, 
condescending. Correct. Talks down to me. They never say humble, great guy, really likable. Uh, and it was same. I grew up Catholic. We, our family, we had to go to mass every single day. Yes. From birth to seventeen. How many of those priests were humble? How many of them were pretentious? Yes. Um, Above all, kiss my ring. Um, children should be seen, not heard. I mean, I mean, yes. I mean, you're not going to build a business being an arrogant no. priest, rabbi, politician, physician, doctor, lawyer. Just be humble. Correct. Be happy. Be relaxed. Quit living in fear. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, ego is a big one, especially in a, in, a, in an industry where patients always are coming to you and seeing you and paying you, it's easy to to forget about the outside world and, and lose a little bit of perspective. Thank but uh, Safa, um, like I say, um, it was an honor. I mean, you hopped on an airplane and flew from I, Brisbane I to come here. It. I wouldn't have missed it. And um, um, when I got here, I, I have several dentist friends who tell me you're the smartest businessman. No, no, no. Please, you're building No, me no, no. <laughs> and uh, you're an innovator. You're a Thank pioneer. You. It was an honor for you to come on my Thank show Thank you. Today. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, a pleasure seeing you. Thank you. Thank you.